The following podcast is brought to you by Pro Wrestling Connect, Australia's newest choice for event management and brand development specialising in pro wrestling. And now, now the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. Watch, Watch global. global. Support local. local. It's the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. You Podcast. The move. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, and welcome to the most must listen to WWE podcast in Australia. Welcome to the B Plus podcast. My name is AJ, and I'm flying solo as the lonely fan again as we head through a view from the WWE universe. We're any threat to stomping grounds. We're a week away, and I'm actually getting a little pumped for this uh, pay-per-view, I guess you can call it, even though we had one two weeks ago. But yeah, th- this pay-per-view is actually really exciting for me as a fan, because it looks as if WWE have started to turn things around. And by that, we're going to head straight into Monday Night Raw, where we have our opening segment, with the show opening with Elias on his guitar, as usual. With the wild card, because he's from SmackDown, but he's now on Raw. So, the SmackDown people open Monday Night Raw. Spits some heel words about Los Angeles. And announces that he was chosen for the special guest referee spot. On Monday's pay-per-view stomping ground match between Baron Corbin and Seth Rollins for the Universal Championship. Before he could continue with his little playing do 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 stuff. The current Universal Champion, Seth Rollins attacks Elias from behind with a steel chair, which seems to become his best friend. Laying him out, after beating him like crazy, Seth then gets on the mic and announces that on Sunday, which is you know Monday for us here in Australia because time zones, Corbin needs to find a referee. He doesn't care who, who or what Corbin has to offer because they will all receive the same fate as Elias. Holds up the steel chair... That he just beat Elias with over his head as if to say, yo, this is my buddy. You all need to like my buddy. This sort of set the tone for the week. Seth is mental, so this is pretty fun. Uh, you get an ad break. Elias is still actually in the ring. The Miz makes his entrance. While Elias is still in the ring, hits him with a skull crushing finale. Lashley's music hits next, who then hits Elias with a spear, makes entrance Cesaro, which is strange because last week he was, there were reports that he was injured, but by the looks of this, he's not injured now, and he's actually looking really fit. So there was, there was no taping, no nothing, no bandages, so it was really strange to see where these rumors actually come from, but he looks to be fine, and he's in this match, so that was pretty cool, and of course he hits Elias with the Cesaro swing. Ricochet enters second last, eventually hits Elias with the double knee to the face, or, you know, the Jericho's knee to face thing. I can't remember what that's called. Uh, I can't remember what that's called at the moment. And then Braun Strowman, being the last entrant, of course, hits Elias with the running power slam. My question with all of this is who the fuck did Elias piss off to cop all of that? He's doing, like, all this stuff with Shane at the moment on screen, and then just get lays out by five people in a row. Was this just to also dominance coming into this opening match for Monday Night Raw? Or did Elias just genuinely piss someone off backstage? Like, I'm kind of confused. So it was very strange. And of course, by this match coming up, I mean the first match of Monday Night Raw, a fatal five-way elimination match, number one contendership for the United States Championship, which the current United States Champion, Samoa Joe, is actually sitting out at ringside. Match gets into a quick, quick dominance here, as Braun seems to be dominating most of it. Uh, Cesaro putting off a bit of strength, actually picking up and dropping Braun with a fireman's carry before Cesaro is eventually eliminated by a pinfall by Braun. Cesaro's got some bloody strength to him. Like, I, I can understand that there's a lot that a lot of people don't realize that Cesaro is quite strong. 
But to him, pretty much with ease, dead weight, pick up Braun and throw him over his head like he was nothing. It's, it's a pretty impressive feat of strength. I've got to give it to him. Lashley then, of course, eliminated by, by Braun via pinfall. Lashley, uh, even though he did get eliminated, hits Braun with a spear after a little time sitting out the side. Cesaro then hits Braun with a neutralizer. Ricochet then hits the 630 on Strowman and pins Braun Strowman with the help of Lashley and Cesaro sort of holding Braun Strowman down. This does not sit well. After this sort of happens, Braun Strowman gets to his feet. He launches Lashley outside. Then launches a ricochet over the ropes at Lashley. Cesaro gets thrown to the Tron, pretty much like a Fusro dart into the Tron. That's a Skyrim reference for people who don't understand Skyrim. And it was really strange. So we come down to the final two, the Miz and Ricochet. They had some decent sort of back and forth between the two. Ricochet doing some over-the-top rope dives, of course, which got the uh, the not-bad meme face from Joe, which I found pretty funny. It was fast pace, decent action. Ricochet, in the end, hits the 630, pinning the Miz. We have a new number one contender for the United States Championship. And, of course, Samoa Joe being Samoa Joe, being that typical heel, attacks him after the match. But Ricochet ended up getting the upper hand anyway, making Samoa Joe walk out. This is how WWE need to do it more often. I personally found this to be really, really nice to have a legitimate number one contenders match rather than throwing random people into matches that don't really have significance. These number one contenders matches to me growing up have been one of the highlights because you get some of the dream matches that you want in this sort of style. And it was really, really nice to see five superstars all have the capability of being the number one contender, fight for it, earn it. Congratulations, Ricochet. Let's see what you do at Stoppy Grounds. Of course, WWE pushing Seth uh, Rollins and Becky Lynch as a couple. Have they ever announced they were at the MTV Music and TV Awards, even showing a photo of them kissing? This is... This is something that frustrates me. I'm I'm all for them being together. I'm all for everyone happy and finding love and blah, blah, blah. What I'm not particularly happy with is WWE don't have a good track record of showing relationships. The ones that were really standing out are, of course, Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella. They got married and have, have kids. Miz and Maurice married and have kids it's really strange because a lot of stuff that's been put into the front line, if you're not within that reality TV show like Total Divas, you don't really see the outside of their lives. And to show off Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins, even though neither of them are in Total Divas or any reality shows, yes, they are the faces of the the brand at the moment, but it just still, to me, it just doesn't sit right. And, I want to know what you guys think. So, of course, don't forget to leave a comment wherever you guys listen to these videos, or podcasts, I should say. Um, and let us know what you guys think about WWE openly advertising their relationships. Then we get the second segment for Monday Night Raw. Becky Lynch and Lacey Evans having like a little in-ring thing. Becky goes on to say she's sick of Evans and she wants to kick her ass all over Los Angeles. Yes, that's right, Angleys. That's how Becky says it, and I love it. It was great. It just her accent just comes out so well. Lacey Evans does eventually comes out and says that no one cares about Becky Lynch and that she has it wrong. Lacey says she's been through it all, the things the man that can't even understand, and that Hollywood should make a movie about her because she's not just a lady. She's a real U.S. Marine. Then Becky and Lacey, of course, have a little back and forth, banter. Becky, a quarter of the line for this segment for me, I respected who you were, of course, Becky to Lacey, but who you are right now is not the steaming pile of trash. I love it. It was great. And of course, uh, before Lacey could enter the ring completely, 
Becky Lynch catches her between the ropes and lays her out with a exploder, leaving, holding the title high, and of course, stealing Lisa's hat while she's at it because she's a classy lady. And she also just wanted to, to give Lisa the shits, which worked. So that was fantastic. This build, yes, we saw this straight after WrestleMania, but I don't know. I feel like this build has got a fair bit going for it, and I'm enjoying it. And of course, we had a backstage segment. I don't know what WWE were doing with the camera crew this week because they were showing more of the crowd, like little bits and pieces. It was very strange. And of course, after winning the Raw Tag Team titles last week, Dash and Dawson, otherwise known as The Revival, are seen walking backstage in what looks to be half a suit from Connor. So, you know, shout out for Connor, the company, the clothing company here in Australia, because you dress The Revival. They enter a room that is currently occupied by Drew McIntyre and the best in the world, Shane McMahon, sort of sharing some drinks and some food and looking like they're having a genuine time. Genuine good time, I should say. We get a quick interview segment with Baron Corbin. Uh, Charlie Cruz asks about the attack on Elias, saying Elias also no longer wants the spot, a special guest referee. Corbin reveals that he has a person in mind, saying that he will reveal it on the Kevin and Sammy show, Rollins attacks him behind with a chair, and just the, <laughs> this bit, he was like, you know, I would offer you a chair, but I've got work to do. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> offered him a seat. <laughs> Get it? Oh, that was funny, actually. I- I'm, a, I'm a sucker for puns, and that was great. And then the next uh, camera cut goes to the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, Rowan and Brian. They are, they're on the stage. They go on to say that they know why the McMahon family brought him to Raw as the wild card, and that's because this place sucks. And by this place, he means both Raw and Los Angeles. It says that it's filled with ignorant and impotent people, but say they're here to excite and educate the people of LA, and he's going to do that by destroying Seth Rollins and show that they are the best tag team in the WWE which is then, of course, answered by the Viking Raiders, who came out and sort of, they have like a little stare down with Rowan and Brian. It was, it was almost like they were teasing something. I'm probably just reading too much into it. Uh, then you get the second match, which was actually 35 minutes into Raw, which I didn't understand. Like, normally there's two matches by now. Like, the ending of two matches, but... I don't know, the first match was decent. We've got a couple of backstage segments. So 35 minutes into Raw, we're getting our second match, which was, in a sense, a tag team match. Ivar and Eric, the Viking Raiders, versus, I think then I got the names of Rustin and Randy Taylor, which are local job- jobbers in the Indies, of course. Raiders winning with a dominant performance. Of course, this was just a <laughs> filler, I think. R-Truth, the 24-7 champion in the crowd, dressed as Carmella. Uh, just uh, with Carmelo dressed up as um I didn't get what they were dressed up as because I'm not American, but apparently they looked good to the Americans. I don't know, but of course the mid card roster comes down, chases them around. Truth goes to hide under the ring. Everyone sort of works works together to pull Truth out, but instead it actually turns out that Titus O'Neil, and then Truth escapes the same way he came in, and then leaving through the crowd. These twenty four seven stuff is so much fun. I love it. Kevin and Sammy show, or is it the Sammy and KO show, or is it the KO and Sammy? I, there are so many different ways that people say it. Sammy's air guitar made my day during this entrance. Holy shit, that was good. That was like probably the best air guitar I think I've ever seen because he was just going at it. Oh, sorry, Paul Heyman's. Paul Heyman's air guitar was fantastic, but still, I love air guitars. They're great. But before we get into the KO and Sammy show, there was a quick backstage segment. The Revival, Shane and Drew are all having their party. Heath Slater comes in. He's sort of talked over the top of it. Then he gets to Shane. He goes, oh, I kind of want to ask for a, a raise in my contract. Shane just flat out says no. And he's like, no, nah, private party, get out. Sort of kicks him out. Drew follows him out of the room and says that he felt bad with what just happened. He knows his family, knows the struggles. Goes to offer Heath some money and just blatantly drops it. It's just kind of like as if he throws it on the ground. It was just kind of comedic. Health, Heath offers to pick it up. And as he does, ends up copying a right hook from Drew. And then follows up by smashing Heath's head. 
repeatedly, just one after another after another, into the container behind it. It looks bloody brutal. Revival sort of get in between and pull Drew off Heath at the same time trying to pick up all the money that was dropped as well, which seemed to be a lot more than what was expected. It was pretty funny, actually. I enjoyed watching the, the Revival do that. It was a bit comedic. Uh... But yeah, so Drew just kind of bashed the shit out of his old uh, 3 MB partner, which is one thing, I guess. <laughs> Do it to one of the bees. Yeah. Then we get the next, the actual in-ring segment itself, the Semi and Kevin Owens show. Kevin Owens introduces Baron Corbin to all his bullshit accolades, you know, the Golden Gloves champion, former United States champion, former Royal General Manager, blah, 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 blah. They have a quick recap of everything that Seth has been through with Brock Lesnar and what he's been doing recently. Sammy and Kevin do the smart, the smart thing and actually withdraw their names from contention of being the referee. That was pretty damn funny how they do that. Corbin then announces that someone who can count to three is actually going to be the ref. And he announces that EC3 with the ref. EC3 comes out mockingly counts the one, two, three in his hands. And then, out of nowhere, gets demolished by Seth Rollins with, uh, of course, Seth's best friend at the steel chair. And then Corbin says he's back to the drawing board, I guess. And then enter the New Day. Of course, more wild cards from SmackDown Live. It was really strange to see these guys come out after what just happened, but it was pretty funny. Uh, And then, so they, they have a couple of war of words. And then Corbin challenges New Day to a match. And then New Day are like, well, what if we had someone who could, you know, sanction the match? So Xavier Woods and Big E pick up EC3 and throw him around like a ragdoll, nodding his head. And uh, EC3 just uh, announces the match, sanctions it with a, with an extremely high voice because apparently getting hit by a chair hurts. Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, and then, of course, he gets dropped on his face by Big E and Xavier. That was pretty funny as well. That, that This whole part was just comedic. It was good. Uh, backstage, we see AJ Styles on Raw for the first time in a couple of weeks. Uh, it sounds like the doctors are about to clear him until the good brothers, Gallows and Anderson, come in and be like, nah, nah, nah. Until AJ says, you know what? You guys have gotten comfortable. You feed it with the new... With most of the tag teams, and he goes off to list them, so he's got the New Day, he's got the Revival, the Usos. But they've gotten comfortable. They dominated Japan for ages. Gallo seems to take offense to this and gets in the face of AJ. Could we see, like, a, a mentoring sort of thing coming on, a club reunion? It'd be good to see these guys together again because I do enjoy that it was such a short little run but it's good to see they don't need AJ to get over they all have the same amount of saying talent it would be good assistance putting them with AJ to get them back on TV Uh, now that they're all on the same brand and in a sense with the brands with not with the brand split but with the wildcard rule they could jump between Smackdown and Raw introduce Finn Balor into the club and they could have like their own little version of the Bullet Club in a sense. It would be really cool to see. And then we could have like Bullet Club versus Undisputed Era at Survivor Series. Team WWE versus Team NXT. I still want that match to happen too. That match would be great. However, I digress. We are still on Monday Night Raw. In the third match of Monday Night Raw, which is nearly an hour and a half in. The six man two out of three falls match. The New Day versus Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, and Baron Corbin. It is announced at the mid-match that Xavier Woods, alongside his pro team at the Fortnite Block Party and the Fortnite Pro-Am, raised over $32,000 for Connor's Cure. So I want to say congratulations to Xavier Woods. You did play well. I did watch that Block Party and the Pro-Am. You did well. Fantastic. And of course, Xavier Woods rolling up Sami Zayn for the first fall this was really good. I, this match was actually pretty decent until uh, Baron Corbin gets a little out of hand, a little careless in the ring, I would say. It goes for a clothesline, of course, Kofi Ducks, ends up hitting Sami Zayn. Owens and Zayn 
uh, Owens and Corbin, sorry, get to a bit of push and shove match. And then Kevin lays out Baron Corbin with a super kick, which allows Kofi to hit the trouble in paradise for the pinfall victory. So the winners, of course, are the New Day with Kofi Kingston on a 15-match winning streak. Doesn't include house shows, of course, but wow. 15 matches in our day and age are pretty damn good. Like the last person who went on a decent winning spree was Asuka. So maybe we could see something similar. It would be good. But this set probably be the worst way to build Baron Corbin going into his Universal Championship match. Like they want to have him be the next top guy and they just fed him to Kofi Kingston. Like, yes, I get Kofi Kingston is the current WWE champion, but it wouldn't have hurt either star if they were not involved in the pinfall. For example, if, like, Big E pinned Sami Zayn. It just, it made Baron Corbin look a bit softer because he just lost to one champion. And heading into Stumping Grounds could lose to another. In In a sense, like, yes, they're champions for a reason, but it was also a little strange to see how this all worked out. Then we get a backstage segment with Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. And Alexa surprises Nikki with a women's champion tag team championship match later on on Monday Night Raw, which is pretty cool. We get a in-ring segment by Paul Heyman saying he isn't comfortable with Seth running around being a maniac. Um, and it just goes on to say that the beast is still, you know, around. Paul Heyman being on both Raw and SmackDown this week was pretty strange. Could could we see Paul Heyman being the guy that does the the whole like I'm watching, I will cash in whenever I will, similar to how I think it was CM Punk that used to tease it like that, and Randy Orton who used to tease it like that. But Paul Heyman doesn't actually have the briefcase. He's not the actual Money in the Bank winner. Brock Lesnar is. But it could be a good way to sort of tease it a little bit more because it could be, oh, Paul Heyman's here, but is Brock here? Not that they travel together all the time, but that would be a pretty way to good, pretty good way to actually like mold that fact that we still have a Mister Money in the Bank because at Super Showdown he never cashed it in, the bell never rang, so it's interesting, and I'm excited to see how they play it out. Next match, of course, we get the Usos versus the Good Brothers. That was announced earlier during the day. Uh, The Usos do defeat the Good Brothers after a double super kick. This was a pretty decent matchup. Not the greatest start for what the Good Brothers needed, but let's see how they go. And, of course, during this uh, match, Clash of Champions was announced for September. So don't forget to get your WWE Network because for new subscribers, that will be free in the month of September. I don't know why I just plugged the WWE Network on a B-plus show. It was really strange. Uh, however, we do get a Roman Reigns segment coming up because, you know, wildcard. Straight out calls Shane McMahon for a one-on-one. Like, you got lucky. Shane's like, no, you know what? You know, Roman should be worried about Drew. Drew goes to cut a promo, starts talking about Roman's family. Roman leaves the ring and head through the crowd. The rival do cut him off back in the tunnels, but end up getting absolutely wrecked by Roman. Um, he gets into the room, has a little back and forth between Drew McIntyre, and ends up putting Drew McIntyre through the table that they had all the food on, so like, you know, poor food. Uh, and then Shane runs to the crowd, jumps over the barricade, looks like he's lost Roman Reigns, but then Roman Reigns comes out of nowhere over the barricade, tackles him, Lends a few rights before throwing Shane into the ring. Hits a Superman punch, followed by a spear to get his redemption for Super Showdown. Then we have uh, the Women's Tag Team Championship match. The Iconics defending against Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Thank fuck Nikki Cross finally half came out to her own music because it is good music and she deserves it. People need to know who she is. Bailey, of course, is at ringside for this match in one of those really comfy chairs. The match itself was, eh, it, it maybe like one and a half, two stars out of five. Like, it, I struggled to watch it. I actually struggled to watch this match. I'm a huge fan of Alexa Bliss and the Iconics, but this was tough to watch. 
Of course, Bailey being at ringside did cause a little distraction as Alexa pushes Bailey over. Bailey retaliates by pushing up, pushing over Alexa Bliss as Billy Kay rolls up Nikki. You can see after the match that Alexa is blaming Bailey for the loss. This shows that Nikki was coming into play at Stomping Ground. And we get possibly one of the best Firefly Funhouse segments I've ever seen. So, Bray Wyatt, of course, watering some plants, says that our minds are like gardens. They need water and sunshine to grow. They say that some people's minds are just full of worms, and that is no good. Then he goes on to say that people are liars as well, because he said, you know what, our parents told us that the world is round. But have they really travelled around the globe? And they also say that the dinosaurs are extinct. But where's the proof? So we know that Bray Wyatt thinks that dinosaurs are still around. Well, yeah, crocodiles, sort of. And he's a flat earther? I think? I I couldn't... I, what? What? Flat Earth? Please? No, don't bring that into the WWE. That's just useless. But he said he knows what it's like to be different. And that is why he built the funhouse. So he can be different. And then he goes on to say that fear is power. And that f- people follow power. He says, follow the leader. Probably referencing to himself. And then a compilation of a couple of bit of a funhouse show plays. Um, there's like bits and pieces. And then it goes into the, the Fiend style suit. And the kids are chanting, follow the leader. It's really weird. That was just creepy. But it had to be one of the best Firefly Funhouse segments that they've ever done. And it makes me pumped for his return. It's going to be really, really interesting on how and when he actually returns because it's going to be really interesting. Then we get the main event of Monday Night Raw: Seth versus Seth Rollins versus Daniel Bryan. Uh, it does get into a decent match until Rowan interferes, hits the cla- the claw slam on Seth Rollins onto the ring apron, keeps attacking him, causing the disqualification. Bryan hits the running knee, starts on the. After that, New Day come out to make the save. Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, and the Revival come down to attack the New Day. Usos come down. Sort of everything becomes even. Looks to turn into like a 10 on 10 tag team match. That would have been pretty good. Uh, however, the match gets restarted with no one allowed at ringside. So it is just De- Seth versus Daniel on their own. And this was a really, really good back and forth match. These guys put on fantastic matches. Seth eventually getting the win with a stomp. Which I'm surprised that they allowed Daniel Bryan to, you know, cop, uh, giving his history. But it was, it was a good way to do it. And then, of course, you get halfway up the ramp. Corbin actually gets his revenge. Seth Rollins and attacks him with a chair. Hits the end of days in the ring to make a pure statement. Heading directly into stomping grounds by holding the belt high. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but every time someone does that, they lose at that pay-per-view. So, I'm pretty sure Seth's going to retain. <laughs> of course, overall, it was actually pretty decent this week. Five decent matches, one job of match to enhance the Viking Raiders a bit more. And the build for Corbett and Seth for Universal Championship came to its peak here, where Seth is showing what he was capable to do anything to make sure it's going to be an even match. The women's tag team titles seem to get yet another afterthought for their match this week. It just, one didn't seem like a legit tag team. I don't know, you get so many different tag teams out there, but this just wasn't one of them. And this match also didn't really seem to have an impact. So it seems as though they're now wasting another championship because, you know, WWE doesn't care for their tag team division. The 24-7 title, once again, got a comedic run on this episode. I have to admit, as much as I hate the design of the belt, it does make for a good spot filler. Get some jobbers onto the show for a tiny bit of time and just all that makes people laugh. So it's good. Ricochet winning the number one contenders match was definitely a good bonus for him. As we get to see Samoa Joe as a monster heel at the moment, it would take a fair bit for anyone to win it off him. I actually think a high flyer like Ricochet could potentially do it. Um, it, I guess we just got to see what happens at Stoppy Graham. But to me, the biggest thing that stood out on Raw this week 
was indeed the Firefly Funhouse. Bray's new character, the Fafint, has gotten so many people talking, and it seems that this is what he wanted. Saying that fear is power and that you should follow the leader, in a sense, follow power, is a new way of Bray saying follow the buzzards. The clip that played after the segments, we potentially may be seeing him return to the ring, or at least to TV very soon. So build up for Monday Night Raw coming into stomach crowds was really nice. Uh, I guess we haven't seen one like that in a while, and it was pretty fun to watch. We've got a few more backstage stories coming out of Monday Night Raw. Of course, former WWE champion John Cena was seen backstage, along with the Bella Twins, as they filmed some segments for the WWE Network. It's also worth noting that actors Seth Green and O'Shea Jackson Jr. were in attendance, probably for the same reason to do something with the WWE Network. I would have to say that's it. Um, and even though Clash of Champions was just announced, two of the following matches have already been advertised. Of course, the card is always subject to change, but if WWE want to sell tickets to this thing, they really need to change these matches, or at least to add to them. The ones that have been advertised are pretty much uh, rematches from Stomach Grouts. So you're getting Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler for the WWE Championship and Becky Lynch versus Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's title. These are the matches advertised. Of course, that can change. Let's see what happens. In other news, prior to Monday Night Raw, as many people know, WWE filmed the main event, which is, of course, the lesser-known 205 preview, sort of, where the mid-card people go. <laughs> but a match between Sarah Logan and Dana Brooke was happening. The X was thrown up for the refs to stop the match, due to a severe cut above the eye of Dana Brooke after she connected with the ring post a little bit harder than expected. It is unclear how serious Brooke's injury is, and fingers crossed it was just superficial, doesn't need anything more than a few stitches to fix it. The worry is the actual proximity of the injury to her eye. However, from photos taken by fans at the event, the cut appears to be above her eye, which is the case. Hopefully she's just okay, has a speedy recovery. Raw ratings have been released, uh, for this week, 2.235 million people tuned into Monono Raw, which is up 5.2% from last week. The first hour covering 2.3 million, second hour 2.303, and the third hour 2.07. So up 5.2, it's really good coming out of Monono Raw, leading into a pay per view. Uh, so yeah, that was pretty much Monono Raw. So here's a word from our sponsors, real quick, just to be able to have. Uh, some good words out there, and then we'll head into SmackDown Live. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. This month, we are sponsored by Grapple, a fantastic new wrestling app available on iOS and Google Play, completely for free, where you can rate all the matches that you watch in WWE, Impact Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, all across the world, and we are even getting Australian wrestling involved in the Grapple app rating system as well, starting with PWA Pro Wrestling Australia, uh, their Green Label event from the other week is up there. The Black Label event, All Eyes on Troy, is up there. And the last two years of events, at least, are up on Grapple right now for you to rate so that people can get around our Aussie wrestling and see that we are just as good as anywhere else in the world. Basically, Grapple is a Rotten Tomatoes for wrestling. Now we all get a say. It is the democratization of match rating systems for pro wrestling. It's amazing. So uh, I get a say, you get a say. Uh, you can follow me on there. At Greg Unchained, you can follow uh, Big Boy Mikey at B plus underscore Big Boy. At Mr. Mysterious is on there. At Danders is on there. At J is on there. We're all on there rating the matches that we watch. Uh, so follow us. We'll follow you back. Let's build this community and get uh, as many Australian wrestling fans onto the Grapple app as we can. You can download it right now. It has over 30,000 matches on there going back to 1985. 15 promotions around the world. There's so much to do on the Grapple app. It's a great little community, so get around it. It's grapple, G-R-A-P-P-L dot C-O, and uh, it's for free on, on App Store and Google Play. Get around it. Hey, everyone. Just want to take a second to tell you about one of our new sponsors, Outbreak Nutrition. Outbreak Nutrition are creating supplements for survival, sharper minds, quicker reflexes, all the energy you need to take your performance to the next level, whether that be on the field, in the gym, 
on the gaming field. That's right. They have specifically designed gaming supplements as well to help you focus on those late night sessions. They even sell coffee, you guys, at Outbreak Nutrition. You can get coffee pods. You can get coffee beans. You can get supplements for the bedroom as well if you want to enhance your performance there. These are performance enhancing supplements for every aspect of your life specifically designed by gamers for gamers to stay fit and healthy in the gym, to stay sharp and focused on the game, and to dominate in all areas of life. So check out OutbreakNutrition.com, and for being a listener of our podcast, they will give you 10% off your order when you enter the code B+. That is B-P-L-U-S at checkout. So make sure if you want to stay on top of your game, if you want to take your performance to the next level, OutbreakNutrition.com, enter the code B+, at checkout. And we're back. Thank you very much for listening to that, guys. Uh, let's head straight into SmackDown Live. So we get New Day open the show because SmackDown guys open a SmackDown show because we are SmackDown Live. They open the show with Big E giving some high kicks on his way to the ring because he is flexible as fuck. I didn't realize, like, his big boots are actually, like, at his head. I didn't realize how easy he could do that. That's, like, that's like some RVD kind of stuff there. And of course, the new day, the new day hype. Kofi Kingston's steel cage mats at stomping grounds against Dolph Ziggler. Xavier Woods goes on to announce that he will be facing Dolph later on on SmackDown. And then Big E sort of deems the last hour of SmackDown to be freaky hour, which gets a little gets a few looks from the new day. And he's like, you know, but but it's okay because there will be slip and slides, and of course, Xavier Woods will be there. Like it was just it was funny. I didn't get what they meant by freaky. It was weird but it plays for some pretty interesting stuff and of course Dolph's music hits um, because the heel always interrupts it comes out and says that New Day are distracting everyone distracting everyone from what they saw at Super Showdown and goes on to say that Kofi Kingston doesn't deserve to be WWE champion and follows up by saying without the New Day Kofi Kingston would be nothing because just judging by that, going off what happened at Super Showdown, the, Xavier Woods did technically get involved, and Dolph Ziggler looked like he had it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the steel cage this week. And of course, Dolph goes on to say that next time Kofi Kingston goes to Ghana, it won't be a celebration, it will be an apology tour, because he will have to look everyone in the eye and tell them when everything was on his shoulders, Backed into a corner, locked inside a cage, defending alone, and he failed. Dolph goes on to say that at Stomping Grounds, after he beats up Kofi Kingston, slams him around the cage, it will be him. Of course, referring to himself as he who will walk out of the cage as your new WWE champion. Kofi Kingston retaliates by saying no matter what happens, whether it's by punishing Dolph, pinning him, going over the top of the cage, or by kicking Dolph so hard in the head with the trouble in paradise that he will just walk out the door. He will remain your WWE champion. But before that, Xavier Woods has been itching to pop Dolph in the mouth. Dolph says that after the match, Xavier will never be able to help Kofi again. And then on Sunday, it'll be him. Of course, referring him being the WWE champion. I don't understand the it should be me thing. I don't know, just like pure jealousy on Dolph's behalf. It was just weird. Uh, of course, the first match, Dolph Ziggler versus Kofi Kingston. Uh, it was a good match. Xavier getting some, men- some momentum, of course. Zayn and Owens attacking Kofi and Big E from behind. Little kerfuffle outside the ring, and the ref ends up ejecting them all from ringside. Decent back and forth run straight after. Dolph becomes a bit more dominant of the two. Delivers a few super kicks, one which included Woods being like tangled on the ropes. And that, like, it hurt like hell. Puts him down for the pin, and your winner for the first match is Dolph Ziggler. There's a backstage promo. Uh, Curtis Axel, Bo Dallas, and Shelton Benjamin are seen waiting outside of Corbin's office, because, yes, Baron Corbin is apparently there, uh, vying for the spot as special guest referee. Shelton Benjamin's like, no, 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 you, you guys think that this can help you get into the main event spot. I'm here to use... Marin Corbin. Of course, Matt Hardy walks out. (laughs) Matt Hardy walks out of Corbin's office and he's like, Senior Benjamin, it's your turn. 
And then Sean Benjamin's like, it's Mr. Benjamin. Mr. And then, of course, walks in. I don't know. I just found Senior Benjamin to sound, you know, kind of ironic. But I suppose that's what SmackDown is. It's ironic. But it's good to see that Matt's still on TV. But, you know, he needs to be doing things, please. Because Matt Hardy is an amazing wrestler. Anyway, uh, Moment of Bliss is, of course, the next thing. Alexa Bliss complains that there isn't any coffee, which introduces Bailey for, somehow, because coffee means Bailey. Well, sort of, because Bailey came out drinking Alexa Bliss's coffee, so it was pretty funny. And of course, repping a Rey Mysterio t shirt, which was awesome because, you know, Rey Mysterio was one of her idols, one of my idols, one of the millions of people's idols. So it was good to see her in it. Uh, Bailey goes on to say that she never tweeted. Uh, anything bad or said anything bad about Alexa Bliss and then goes to apologize to Nikki that because uh, Nikki Cross is still out there as well uh, that Alexa Bliss isn't really her friend and she's just using her saying that she's had enough of Alexa talking behind her back as well I guess to say it to her face Alexa goes on a rant about how she started in NXT she saw right through Bailey everyone was mean and made Alexa feel like she didn't belong so she turned to who she thought was the nicest person in the room. Uh, it turned out it wasn't because she went to Bailey. And even though, and she even made Alexa feel useless. The only person who was even nice to her in NXT was Charlotte. But now Bailey comes out with her Bailey buddies dressing like she works at Forever 21. She's in a hugger. She's a liar. That had to be my quote of the night for SmackDown Live. Dressing like you work at Forever 21. That's honestly like. That's spot on. Bailey's response was, of course, saying that Alexa is doing the same thing to Nikki as she did to Nia Jax and Mickey James, that Alexa really isn't a goddess. She's just an entitled little princess that doesn't deserve a damn thing. Alexa's response, she's not entitled. She's just better than you, of course, referencing to being better than Bailey, And then saying that she is a placeholder, that she peaked in NXT, and that the one person she thought was not deserving ended up living out her career that she always wanted this prompted Bailey to hit Alexa with a right hook. It goes to town on Alexa Bliss before Nikki Cross gets in between and pulls Bailey off Alexa. Then goes ballistic at her, just starts screaming, distracting Bailey long enough for a blindside shot from Alexa Bliss, laying Bailey on the floor to end the segment. And Alexa getting a little bit of momentum coming into Stumper Grabs, which is pretty cool. When we get backstage, where Zelina Vega is doing her makeup in pretty much just a bikini top, because apparently we're getting a bit more risque now. Apollo Crews approaches her, saying he's looking for Andrade, and Selena's like, are you really looking for Andrade, or are you just here to flat with me? And no, no, it just didn't work. Apollo Crews wants Andrade, who comes out of nowhere and hits Apollo Crews with a solid, like, elbow to the face, lays him out a little bit, and then goes off in Spanish, walks off with Selena Vega, and you can just see Che Gable in the background taking notes and being disappointed. Now, let's just take a second here. What is going on with Chad Gable's character? He was on 205 Live last week, and it seems as though he's doing, like, this whole Olympic coach look and roll, which I don't understand at all. It's one of those ones that are like, I think I'm going to be really good, so I will write this down. <laughs> that's That's pretty much what I saw. It, it was strange. So, let's see where Chad Gable's character goes from this. Perhaps we can see him into a manager's off a little bit. Of course, the second team is the B team versus Heavy Machinery. Heavy Machinery walking out like the Bushwhackers, which is awesome. It's a nice tribute there. Uh, Heavy Machinery actually dominated most of the match, getting the pinfall victory. Rowan and Brian are on commentary, talking about the upcoming title defense at Stumping Grounds, which is um, coming up soon. Um... And of course, as Seth Rollins, as a B team get up in the ring, Seth Rollins comes out of nowhere, demolishes them both with a chair because they were both seen talking to uh, Baron Corbin. So, yeah, Seth Rollins is making true in his name. Shane then arrives in a limo backstage. Kevin and Sammy are, and Sammy sort of cut him off before he enters the building and complaining that Seth is a bad person from attacking people behind. Uh, excuse me, you both did the same thing less than an hour ago. Why do you think that it's good for you to do it, but not Seth? I don't understand that. It was really strange, uh, but funny. And I guess it was really good. I, I liked the segment because Shane then was like, you know what? 
you go take care of the bad people. Then he books Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for the main event. We get a quick little Alistair Black promo saying that he gets why no one wants to pick a fight with him. He gets it. This isn't a woe is me story. This is a woe is my opponent. Because when they fight, if they fight, he will change the essence of that man. Uh, I can see like a really... This is CJ Sheep looking once more. But I can see like a little bit here where Bray Wyatt actually like knocks on his door. And he's like, let me in. And he's like, well, come in then. And then they get into a brawl. I don't know why that popped into my head. But that would be pretty funny to watch. And we get an in-ring segment. Shane McMahon comes out, sided by, of course, Elias, the greatest acquisition for SmackDown history, and the Royal Wildcard Drew McIntyre. Shane McMahon and Drew sort of hype the upcoming match for Stumber Ground, saying that they are better than Roman Reigns. That he got the cheap shot, he was a dog, and like, I said, it, said all those things. And the Miz comes out, saying that Shane and Drew and the hairy guy and the guitar needs to watch this clip and plays the attack from Raw where he beats Shane down. And then Shane's like, do you think this is funny? And Miz is like, no, 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 you're right. It's not funny. This is funny. And then it shows a clip of Shane running like slow-mo, copying the spear and the Superman punch in slow-mo. That was funny. His reaction to that was pretty funny, actually. Miz and Shane tread a few words together, of course. Shane calling Miz's dad a potato once again. He books a tag team match. Drew and Elias versus the Miz and a mystery opponent. As long as the Miz can find an opponent within 10 seconds. And then circumstances arise. As Shane is counting down the 10 seconds. Our truth pops up out of nowhere. Whether it's under the ring or from over the barricade or something. Obviously trying to hide from the rest of the roster. Ends up getting picked for the match. And awesome truth. Reunite. Again. Because. Yeah sure. Why not? I, I enjoyed the Awesome Truth run, and it was good to see them both in the ring. I would like to see them return as like an actual tag team for a little bit. That would be pretty fun to watch. And of course, Shane McMahon making the match an elimination match. So, all the tag team matches so far have had stipulations on them. Backstage, we see the Authors of Painter coming out of Baron Corbett's office. The Iconics come across and be like, Ooh, impressive, impressive. Until they run into Asuka, Kairi Sane, and Paige. Where Paige breaks to the Iconics that next week in Tokyo, the Iconics will have a match against Asuka and Kairi Sane. Where if Asuka and Sane win, they get a shot at the tag team titles, and it will be iconic. The, there are two two main points about this little backstage segment. It literally lasted for like three minutes. But there's two little things about this that really annoyed me. First thing was the AOP coming out of Corbin's office. But he, they never got attacked by Seth Rollins with a chair. Because that would just look odd. Apparently Seth attacking AOP with a chair. Why didn't it happen? It could have happened when they were like alone or something. I don't know. It, it, it just... That didn't sit right because they never got their coming. If that makes sense. And then... If they were in Tokyo next week. Why didn't Oscar and Kairi Sane just get handed the titles at Tokyo? That would be the perfect place for them to win. Uh, I, I want to say that coming up to it, that something's going to change and then it's going to end up for the titles because it would be cool to see Asuka and Kairi win in Japan and win the championships in Japan. It would be pretty good. Uh, but why have the number one contendership in Japan and then like them get back to the States and have them win it there? Unless they don't win it here and the Iconics hold on to it for a little bit longer. When they are already the longest reigning WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. But still. It, yeah. Uh, you get your third match of SmackDown Live. Awesome Truth reuniting once again. Diverse Drew and the Hairy Man with the guitar, otherwise known as Elias. Truth getting some like what's up chance at the beginning of the match, which is pretty good to see. It does have a decent beginning. Until Shane McMahon gets involved and attacks the Miz, causing the distraction with Truth to be eliminated. As Truth is eliminated, however, a flurry of superstars run down from the ring. Chomp Benjamin grabs the 24-7 belt, doesn't do anything else, just grabs it, and then just does laps around the ring before eventually getting stopped by a referee. It explains that you have to actually pin our Truth for the title. Now, while all these other superstars are getting sort of distracted by the referee, Truth grabs the title and 
bolts. He is gone to buy, have fun, leaving the Miz alone in this match. A back and forth exchange does happen before Miz does get the upper hand a little bit until Drew McIntyre hits a Glasgow kiss from outside the ring um, to the ring because, you know, Miz was in the second rope, I think. But um, yeah, hits a Glasgow kiss and then the Claymore kick. So Drew McIntyre and Allhides get the win. Clean win, really. After the match, Drew hitting the Miz with two more Claymore kicks just to make a steam coming into stopping grounds. Backstage, uh, Emma Moon comes across Carmella looking for Mandy. Well, she's looking for Mandy and Sonya Deville. And, of course, Carmella's looking for Truth. Turning around saying that if you find Mandy and Deville, let them know that we have unfinished business. Emma Moon eventually finds Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose where Sonya and Mandy are, like, talking about donuts. Eventually... Eventually, it took a little bit, but eventually Ember Moon smacking the donuts out of the hands of Sonya and uh, Mandy, and then getting into a brawl with Sonya Deville until refs come out of nowhere to break it up. My question is, are there always refs, like, everywhere? Because no fights just seem to happen. Like, let them fight. But I'm predicting a tag team match coming up, Carmella and Ember Moon versus Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. I'm predicting that to be, like, in three weeks or two weeks' time. It's coming. You can see it. Of course, the Firefly Funhouse was played again. Still the best thing going this week. And then, of course, you get what what you could consider the fourth match, I think. Truth heading outside to sort of head home uh, with the 24-7 championship. As Truth is reaching his car, a referee stands out from the driver's seat. And Truth's like, wait, you're a ref and an Uber driver? And you get... Then gets confused about the shorter Carmella that is behind him. Who actually turns out to be Drake Maverick, who attacks Truth, eventually pinning our Truth with the leverage of the car to become the new 24-7 champion. Then gets in the car, screams out, I'm getting married, and then drives off in the ref's car. And then the issue is that our Truth is concerned because Carmella never told him she was getting married. Uh what? You just lost a championship and that's all you care about? This is going to be good. It's going to be so much fun. And then the next match, oh, also congratulations for your first, to Drake Maverick to, for your first uh, championship in the WWE. And then the main event hits Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Two out of three falls match. The bell rings and then within 10 seconds, Kofi Kingston hits a travel in paradise and gets the first pinfall on Sami Zayn. That was bloody quick. Like, very quick. Match goes back and forth. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn do put up a better fight for the second fall. However, didn't exactly get the job done as Seth does hit the curb stomp on Kevin Owens for the win. Now technically making it 16 victories in a row for Kofi Kingston. We here at the B Plus are really excited for this because this is going to keep going and I'm going to keep counting it because this is fun. And good dark Kofi Kingston. But overall, SmackDown was actually pretty decent this week. Of course, a little more hints driving forward of the Fox move. Looks to be a little bit more like risque stuff coming through. Of course, Selena Vega doing that flirty thing. Big E saying last hour is going to be a bit freaky. I don't know. It's it's fun because I can see Fox sort of pushing something. Uh, I personally think that after this week, Stomping Grounds is going to be the turning point for WWE because they are starting to see that uh, things are heating up in the wrestling world. So it's it's fun to see what's actually going on. Uh, and of course, you get 205 this week. Um, the, f- the first match um, is the Lucha House Party, Lindsay Dorado and Grand Metalik versus the Singh Brothers, where uh, the Singh Brothers actually get the win via pinfall, uh, which is always pretty good. Our uh, next match is Brian Kendrick versus Russ Taylor. Brian Kendrick defeating Russ Taylor by a pinfall. I uh, get a little thing last week. Chad Gable actually debuted on 205, defeating Jack Gallagher uh, in an incredible matchup that ended in a countout victory for Gable. Gallagher was interviewed backstage, disappointed in failing to break the tank out. He said that he and Gable have unfinished business. But before he could continue, Mike and Maria Canellis interrupt him. Mike Canellis called Gallagher and Drake Maverick embarrassments to the 205 Live brand. He said that if they do in fact stay here in the land of the Cruiserweights, he's done being looked over. Gallagher challenges him to a 
match next week, claiming it would be an opportunity to get a black eye in front of his wife. Ouch, that uh, that was a little bit of a burn. And then the uh, main event of 205 Live, Arya Davari versus One Lorkin. Uh, yeah, th- this was a decent match. Actually, this was a really good match. Uh, One Lorkin defeating Arya Davari via DQ, of course, as uh, Davari connected with a steel chair, ending the match for- to cause disqualification. This was good. I- I'm I'm enjoying the-, the main events to have a little bit more, having a little bit more to it. Of course, following the match, Daivari brutalizing Lorcan, tossing him into the stairs knee first. Uh, Daivari brought a barely conscious Lorcan to the top of the ramp, where he drove him head first into the stage, because, you know, ouch. The following, following the match, we heard from Cruiserweight champion Tony Nice and his two challenges, Akira Tozawa and Drew Gulak. Nice said this is a serious challenge, and the odds are against him. But the odds have always been against him. He's ready to face them all come Sunday. Stomping grounds. Have it. There we go. Drew Gulak versus Akira Tozawa versus Tony Nese for the Cruiserweight Championship. That is going to be one for the ages. I'm excited for that match. Let's see it happen on the pre-show. Because WWE doesn't care about the Cruiserweights. And then, of course, we're going to head straight into WWE news and rumors and reports. Uh, which closes out our... Uh, sorry, doesn't stop closing out our week because we have our preview. Um, of course, rumors and stuff. First rumor that comes to, to us today is that the current Raw Tag Team Champions, The Revival, have actually turned down a new contract by the WWE. Uh, the first contract doesn't end until April 2020, but WWE have seemed to be trying to lock all of their talent into longer deals, longer contracts to um, sort of get everything working. This leads into the report that Mike and Maria Canellis have also reportedly re-signed new contracts with the WWE. Even though they all teased that they were leaving the company, uh, reports are saying that Mike and Maria got a significant pay rise, one that they could not turn down, probably because All Elite Wrestling would not match it because WWE have like a billion dollars. And yeah, so this was this was very interesting. Perhaps we're going to see a really nice push for Mike Kanellis uh, on 205 or even on SmackDown or Raw. So potentially they're staying around for a little bit longer, which is pretty good. Uh, in other news, Harvard Business School uh, have announced that they will be doing, uh, alongside multiple uh, tailored brands, they will be doing a case study on the WWE, highlighting the innovations and the challenges that WWE has come across with in their rich 40-year history. This is going to be something that I'm personally going to be following because I enjoy these case studies. I don't know why. It's just one of my things. So this would be pretty cool. Um, following on the news of John Cena and the Bellas being backstage on Raw, Ronda Rousey was seen backstage at SmackDown Live. However, she wasn't alone. She was also accompanied by Marina Schaffer, Jasmine Duke, and the current WWE NXT Women's Champion, Shayna Baszler. None of them really actually appeared on SmackDown. They could have been there filming uh, something for the WWE Network special, which is what John and the Bellas were doing. So there could be that. But yeah, of course, Marina Shafir um, putting some stuff on her Instagram story because people do that these days and put stories online. Uh, and then we have some baby news as well. The Broken, the Woken, the uh, Big Ma- Matt Hardy, Big Money Matt. Uh, that's a mouthful enough. But Matt Hardy has announced that he is expecting his third child. So congratulations to him because that is fantastic. I always love baby news within WWE. It just, it fills my heart with joy. It really does. Uh, and then we're going to head straight into our Stop Me Ground preview. Um, we'll just sort of start from the bottom and work our way to the top. My predictions, uh, Tony Nese versus Akira Tozawa versus Drew Gulak for the Cruiserweight Championship. My pick is Tony Nese to retain. Of course, we've got Daniel Bryan and Rowan. Uh, defending against heavy machinery, I'd like to see Daniel Bryan and Rowan retain. That I would like to see. The New Day, Big E and Xavier Woods versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. New Day to take the win. Samoa Joe versus Ricochet. This one is a little bit harder. I I can't see Samoa Joe losing this before Rey Mysterio returns. I just can't see it. So I'm I'm picking Samoa Joe to to retain here. 
Then you get Bailey versus Alexa Bliss for the SmackDown Women's Championship. My guess is Bailey, uh, and then we see a possible return. Pretty much that SmackDown all straight after the match. And then we get uh, Becky Lynch versus Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's Championship. Becky Lynch to retain because she's our girl and she's amazing. Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre in a match that no one really cares about. I'm guessing Roman Reigns is going over here. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have this for the 10,000th time. Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler in a steel cage match for the WWE Championship, which is pretty interesting. Um, I, I'm excited to see this. To be honest, I wouldn't care who walked out of this with the championship, um, but my prediction is that it's going to be Kofi Kingston with the rumors flying around last week that uh, Shane McMahon is going to be the one to beat Kofi Kingston for the WWE Championship, which please... Please, 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 please don't. Please don't. Whatever you do. WWE, that would just be pathetic. And could be one of those things that make me start boycotting the entire event. It's just pathetic. Don't do that. Anyway, uh, the main event, or probably would be the main event of Stomping Grounds, Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin for the Universal Championship with a special guest referee, uh, which is yet still to be decided. So I'm hopefully, I'm hoping it's going to be like a, a twist. Like it's going to be like Paul Heyman or it's going to be Shane McMahon, or it's going to be like a, a big twist that no one's really going to see coming. That would be pretty interesting to see, and I suppose let's see how it goes. But of course, there are some rumors flying around with Stomping Ground that uh, there could be some returns, uh, and that their card has been shaken up a little bit. So some matches may have actually changed. Um, the, the five possible returns at Stomping Grounds kind of racked my brain a little bit um the five i could think of sorry six a six one's just come to mind uh sasha banks of course returning from her hiatus uh could potentially return to either help uh bailey win or lose um or even just after the match could just you know be there and be like i'm gonna come for you uh the other person uh alistair black could potentially pick a fight with someone my guess it's going to be like Finn Balor heading straight into the Intercontinental Championship picture. That would be pretty cool. Bray Wyatt making his statement known in the WWE Championship match. That is my main prediction is that Bray Wyatt will have some sort of uh, something to be in the championship match. Not like be in the match in her match, but like interfere. So that would be pretty fun to watch. Um, Brock Lesnar. Potentially making an appearance of being Mr. Money in the Bank. As both champions are on the card, Brock Lesnar has all the opportunity. Ronda Rousey uh, was one that I thought of as kind of a long shot, considering she just had surgery on her hand. But depending on how her, uh, of course, her recovery is going, could potentially see her at stomping grounds. And then the one as well that I just thought of while I'm sitting here recording this, Luke Harper. Uh, could potentially make his return to TV soon as well. I'm not sure how in the form at Stomping Grounds, but he's due for his return quite soon. Could potentially make his voice known as Seth with the Seth Rollins and Baron Corbin match. That would be pretty interesting to see. But anyway, that is our Stomping Grounds preview from... Uh, sorry, yeah, preview from uh, the B Plus podcast. My name is CJ, of course. You can find me on Instagram on Instagram at CJ's underscore world. But we collectively are the B-Plus Wrestle on Twitter because wrestling wouldn't fit. The B-Plus Wrestling pretty much everywhere else except for Patreon, which is www.patreon.com forward slash the B-Plus. If you want to get in on our mission to watch global and support local, that is the place to do it. Every dollar that comes in goes towards growing the show and helping get the scene out. Uh, Sorry, get Aussie Wrestling on the map bigger than it already is and of course you can get ad free episodes custom episodes discord access and all sorts of other awesome rewards on there so get around it don't forget to tune into our nxt podcast which is coming up as well very soon and our uh, re- review for stomping grounds which is coming out uh monday tuesday i believe uh, so of course don't forget to like share and subscribe leave us a five-star review if you feel so inclined and as always thank you for listening